The core topics in this surah are claiming knowledge over things about which we know nothing, which we shall see as we proceed through it, uh, creating and following nonsense, which is the um, the stock in trade really of religions. Uh, I use religions in a broad sense, not only to mean traditional religions, but also isms, and scientism and environmentalism and these various other things, nearly all of which have some measure of truth to them, but which are fundamentally flawed. The Quran tells us that bring a surah like this, we cannot, and there's no ism that has been advanced, including any religion, <laughs> traditionalist Islam being one uh, example of that, which is like the Quran. They can't do it. And the third core topic of this chapter is God's statement of reality, what, what is actually real and warning. So to proceed, in the name of God, the Almighty, the Merciful, by the star when it sets. Now this is an interesting oath. There are many oaths in the Quran. And I refer you to the end of the previous chapter, which ends with the words, and at the retreat of the stars. So this is a continuation. Again, this whole segment between Qaf, sort of 50, and and Nas, um, 114, this is of one cloth, really. And it, as I say in other talks, it's this is to form a night vigil in which people are to make their determinations about God. And it is my hope that these talks uh, allow people to do that too. And that these determinations, believers can make their determination about the people who hear these words, because depending on people's response, you can tell who they are. Verse 2, your companion has not strayed and has not erred, and he does not speak from vain desire. Now, Obviously, the traditionists can say, oh, well, they're going to use this as a, as an in for all of their extraneous stuff. But we see that if we look beyond taking one or two little snippets out of context, that, that uh, the recipient of the Quran warned with the Quran. He followed the Quran. This is what he had. This is what he gave. This is what he left. <clears throat> there is nothing else. Verse 3, and he does not speak from vain desire. It is only an instruction given. There taught him one mighty in power, possessed of strength. He took his place when he was in the highest horizon, then drew he near and descended. He was at two bows length or nearer. Then he instructed his servant what he instructed. The heart lied not about what it saw. Will you then dispute with him about what he saw? Now this segment is just establishing a fact that the recipient of the Qur'an, Muhammad, he received or saw whatever it was that he saw. It says here, will you then dispute with him about what he saw? Well, as concerns the traditionalist, unfortunately the answer here is objectively in the affirmative. He has a version other than that which God gave him, which he prefers to the guidance of God on this subject. And such a course of action falls firmly within the definition of disputing with him about what he saw. You don't know what he saw. I don't know what he saw. Claiming knowledge of such a thing is a sin. If you don't have that knowledge, to claim that you have it, to fill in these gaps, is, is a form of disputing with him about what he saw. I accept that he saw. I accept what the Quran tells me on it. I have no further knowledge on it. And I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm disputing with him about what he saw. Verse 13. And he saw him in another descent, by the lote tree of the finality. Near it is the garden of habitation. When there covered the lote tree, that which covered. The vision did not deviate and did not transgress. He has seen among the proofs of his Lord the greatest. Now here we're being given a whole segment which is establishing a fact. That's all you can say. This thing took place. It's given to us as a fact and we accept it as such. We have no further information on this. I have no further information on this. And to seek information on this from outside of a revelation which claims to be preserved and correct and complete, it's not the route I'm personally going to go. Now the narrative changes. Verse 19. Have you considered Alert and Al-Uzur and Manat the third the other. 
Now, this is interesting because these are three gods, inverted commas, independently verified as objects of worship among the people of Petra on the basis of archaeological and architectural fact. Um, this is not something which can be attached to Mecca. I'm not going to get into this particular subject right now, but it's just incidentally interesting. And this is an example of invented gods. And you can have an invented god even if it's one with a monopoly. Yeah, if you're, <laughs> It's not just that a single object of veneration or worship is good in all cases. It's following that which the, the, the true God gave. That's what we're called to, to continue. Have you the males and he the females? This then is an unjust division. They are only names you have named, you and your fathers, for which God sent down no warrant. They follow only assumption and what their souls desire, but there has come to them the guidance from their Lord. Now the comparison here is between what is from God on the one hand and what is made up between reality on the one hand and assumption and vain desire on the other. Quote, they are only names you have named, you and your fathers, for which God sent down no warrant. Now a more recent equivalent in this particular context would be Hadith. God nowhere sanctions it, nowhere. Can you point to the Quran and say, you, Muhammad, you should find somebody to write down all these other things that you're saying, apparently. No. Where's the warrant in the Quran for this? Not there. So all apologetics in favour of this other stuff is based upon itself. If you listen to people who defend the Hadith, they'll take one little bit of the Quran and then suddenly they're... If you watch what they'll do, it's bait and switch. Suddenly that they're using the Hadith to justify the Hadith. Well, that's not any good. But they need that because otherwise their entire religion collapses. This is just uh, what we call in Russian, it's dust into the eyes to distract the mind and draw it into the Hadith. Something which, and I repeat, God sent down no warrant. Verse 24. Now, this is an example of what I call the hanging am, and I refer you to my um, notes on f chapter 52, or look at my note at uh, 2121. So it says, if man is to have what he desires, so if, if this is the claim, man is to have what he desires, I want it so it's true, I believe it so it's true. We have this now, this is a very common assertion that, well, I don't believe God would be like that. I don't think God would do it this way. This isn't how God would operate. If God was good, he wouldn't say this, he wouldn't do this, he wouldn't allow this, blah, 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 blah. If man is to have what he desires, this is, again, this is a, a Q and a It's arguing a point here. This is a common objection. And now we have the, now we have the answer. Verse 25. Then to God belong the latter and the former. So, you may run around with your desires however to god belongs the hour eternity and what we have now all time all reality belongs to god so what side do you want to be on 26 and how many an angel is in the heavens their intercession avails nothing save after that god gives leave to whom he wills and is pleased now this thoroughly dispatches all claims to intercession all if you think you have some special kind of in with God, no. The Trinitarian Christians who look to Jesus to save them are following vanity. If that's the extent of their faith, I'm not saying all Christians are, are following vanity. I'm saying that those who think that Jesus is going to intercede on their behalf, this is, the, the Quran clearly rejects this. And I've listened to a lot of Christian stuff. And I, I come from a Christian background. The Trinitarian Christians, quite frankly, do a, a sort of similar bait and switch because what the traditionalist Muslim does is he has uses the Quran to draw people into the Hadith. And what the Trinitarian Christian does is he uses people's hunger for God to draw him into a, a Pauline, you know, whatever, Greek, Mithraic cult, which is what Trinitarian Christianity is. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I must be clear. The Quran says that the majority of men follow the, the jinn. 
And when I look at a lot of Trinitarian Christian churches and what goes on within them, it's all you know based around the quote unquote Holy Spirit. It's a spirit of some kind. It's all based upon feelings and praying and asking some spirit to possess you fundamentally. Um, it's gin worship, I'm sorry, but it, it is. And the Quran is very clear that intercession doesn't work. And the same holds true for Muslims, those who think that their religion will save them. I've been told this, oh, I'm, you know, my family is Muslim, you know, 37 generations or whatever, whatever it is. It doesn't mean anything. Muslims who think their religion will save them by virtue of the fact that they were born, quote unquote, Muslim, are following vanity. There's no special dealing with God. There's no special pleading. He alone judges. And we have in the Quran a very simple statements of what comprises good deeds and etc. It's not complicated. And, um, you know, if you just stick with believing in God in the last day and doing good works, that's enough to keep you busy for the rest of your life. Just, you know, hang on to those if you, if you want a starting point. And it doesn't require religion. To continue, 27. They who believe not in the hereafter name the angels with the names of females. Now, this doesn't mean, according to my understanding at least, that all such people do this. It does not think everybody who doesn't believe in the hereafter, they all do this. But that it is a characteristic of such people. For example, you could say, Londoners go to the country at weekends. Do all Londoners do this? No, but it's a true statement. It is characteristic that, that certain Londoners do this and we can make this statement. That's my understanding. The broader point, however, which I can assert much more forcefully, is about the vain ascribing of nonsense to things about which we know nothing. And this is really one of the core themes of this particular chapter. And it's something that we are advised to stay away from. If you don't know, say you don't know. There's nothing wrong with not knowing. It's okay. But to start inserting in extraneous interpretations, especially ones which come from outside of the Quran, is uh, something one should be very careful about. God has given men guidance, but yet men follow something else. And they have a thousand reasons to justify it, and usually they cloak it with religion if they're um, not stupid. 28. But how could they have knowledge thereof? Now that's a really good question. How could they have knowledge thereof? <laughs> they follow only assumption, and assumption suffices not anything against the truth. Now this is a continuation of the point raised at 24. If man is to have what he desires, now they don't have what they desire because there is such a thing as the truth. It's not a relative concept. It's not a matter of opinion. It doesn't matter how much you feel it. It doesn't matter how much inside you really do feel that Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter. There is such a thing as objective truth. If you walk off this cliff, you are going to hit the floor at the bottom. There's no two ways about this. This isn't a, a voting, feeling matter. You, you and I, we are going to die one day. These are facts. And our belief and actions have eternal consequences. These are facts. Religion ain't going to save us. It isn't. No feelings are going to save us. They're not. There is a truth. The Quran claims to be the truth. If you don't accept that, okay, walk away from it. But if you do accept it, then take it seriously. Assumption suffices not anything, not anything. It doesn't say it suffices a little bit. Oh, I've got a bit of truth. The Hadith, for example, have got some truth in it. Or this modernism that's been invented has got some truth in it. No, assumption suffices not anything against the truth. Now, claims are made by followers of other literature that, uh, obviously here I mean the Hadith, that Muhammad had this other knowledge and that their Hadith contain it. But this is not the case on a Quranic basis. Um, I, I mean, just as an aside, if 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 the tradition said, you know what, we don't really need the Quran, we follow the Hadith, that's what we're really interested in, there would be some intellectual consistency to that to some extent, but they can't do that because they, they need the Quran. So they have to hang on to this thing. So they're claiming monopoly rights over something which fundamentally causes them more problems than really perhaps it merits. But to be consistent, they should walk away from it in the same way as uh, Trinitarian Christians would be more intellectually consistent if they said, you know what, we don't really believe in Jesus. That's not who we're following here. We're following Paul. And if they said that, OK, I don't follow Paul, but OK, you have a consistent basis, but they don't. Now, I'm going to quote a few 
other verses from the Quran, which just to demonstrate how God talks to Muhammad. Because if you listen to our traditionalist friends quote a few little bits out of context, it can seem that the Quran gives support for their broader claims. But if you look at these are just a few and there are many more. Now this is verse six fifty and it says Say thou, I say not to you, I possess the treasuries of God, nor I know the unseen. Nor do I say to you, I am an angel. I follow only what I am instructed. Say thou, are the blind and the seeing equal? Will you then not take thought? At 6.50, I follow only what I am instructed. Now, the... Obviously, the, the traditionists will broaden that claim. But, uh, again, I say, where's the warrant? Bring the warrant. They have no warrant. Not Quranically. 7188. Say thou, I have no power to do myself benefit or harm, save that God should will. And had I knowledge of the unseen, I would have abundance of wealth, and evil would not have touched me. I am only a warner and a bearer of glad tidings for people who believe. Now that's interesting, isn't it? 9.43 reads, And among them is he who looks towards thee. Canst thou guide the blind when they do not see? Now this is a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously in the negative. 10.20 reads, And they say, Oh, that a proof were but sent down upon him from his Lord. Say thou, The unseen belongs to God, so wait, I am with you waiting. That's 10.20. Does this sound to you like somebody who has got this huge extra knowledge to fill all of these books of the foundation of this religion, which we have come to know as Islam? No, it doesn't. It's a completely different character. It's an utterly different narrative. 1131. And I say not to you that I have the treasuries of God, nor I have knowledge of the unseen, nor do I say I am an angel, nor say I to those whom your eyes disdain, God will not give them good. God knows best what is in their souls. Then should I be of the wrongdoers. Muhammad doesn't have any of this knowledge. Where would he get it all? Bring your warrant for this. Bring your Quranic warrant for this other stuff that you're following. Because the Quran is against you. 29. Then turn thou away from him who turns away from our remembrance and has desired not save the life of this world. Now, this is actually quite an apposite point in my broader sort of narrative. People don't want to rock the boat. A lot of people know that this hadith is nonsense and yet their social life and their safety in this world, maybe they're getting married and it's not convenient for them to rock the boat or this or that. Here you are. Then turn thou away from him who turns away from our remembrance and has desired not to save the life of this world. I can't tell you how nice it would be to be a member of a nice, big, friendly, happy club. But unfortunately, there isn't one I can join with any integrity. So I'm doing what I'm doing. Is it easy? No. Is it fun? No. Would I prefer to be doing something else? Definitely. But we have to live with the consequences of our decisions. You're not going to die in a crowd. And no one else is going to answer for you. And there is no intercession. We are born alone. And we die alone. And we are judged alone. And that's the truth. Verse 30. This is their extent of knowledge. I.e. what has been referred to above. Which is the life of this world. That's all they know. Thy Lord knows best him who strays from his way. And he knows best him who is rightly guided. Now, again, it's not the place of the messenger to guide. This, this is somehow insinuated into the Hadith literature and those who expound and base their religion upon the same, that somehow that this is the how-to, that this is how you follow the Quran. Here's a verse at 28.56. Thou guidest not whom thou lovest, but God guides whom he wills, and he knows best the rightly guided. Is this not a clear verse? It's not that... Muhammad or anyone else is going to guide you or me but God guides whom he wills and he knows best the right to guide it and we read at 46 9 say thou I am no new thing among the messengers I know not what will be done with me or with you I follow only what I am instructed and I am only a clear warner is that not clear is that not specific enough for us 
Yet, if you look at the Hadith, this character in the Hadith, he's basically Yoda. In nothing he doesn't know. The Day of Judgment, whether you can wear yellow or wear gold if you're a man. or There's no question that you can't ask him that cannot be confidently answered. Show me the Quranic warrant for this library. Donkeys carrying books. That's what the Quran says about the, the followers of Judaism. Well, if the shoe fits. And to God belongs what is in the heavens and what is in the earth. This is verse 31. That he might reward those who do evil with what they do and reward those who do good with good. Now, this is really central. What we find amongst a lot of the hadith is justifications for doing evil, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's mixed in there, poison with the honey. The Quran is very clear. Religion won't save you. Head knowledge about complex doctrines won't do it. It's our actions which are for us or against us. And th those actions which are good, which are righteous, are clearly stated in the Quran. People don't like the Quran, not because they can't understand it, but because they can understand it. Just follow the bits you understand. Believe me, the rest of it will take care of itself. Start with believing in God on the last day and doing good works. Do you not know what a good work is? It's, it isn't complicated. 32. Those who abstain from the enormities of falsehood and sexual immoralities save slight mistakes. This is the inverse of my values in the Quran of what I demonstrate for Salat and Zakat. Salat is the duty. It's duty to believe in God alone. <laughs> One who betrays one's duty, and this is an old use of English, but is false. When one is false, one is unfaithful. And the enormities of falsehood, I'm sure the traditionalist has got a load of stuff on what he'll tell you that is. But on a pantextual basis, falsehood is quite clear. And this is one of the meanings of falsehood. It's when you are not true to your duty, to your oath, to your allegiance. And I'm sure that can have other repercussions. You know, Your actions will be based upon this because belief and action, they're intrinsically connected. And sexual immoralities save slight mistakes. Now, sexual immorality, this is the inverse of my value for zakat, which is sexual morality. It is preserving sexual integrity within oneself and the community. And there's a reason for this. It's a physiological reason for it. When a man restrains, contains his sexual energy, he gets power. There's no two ways about it. Now, if you haven't looked into this and you don't know about it, do look into it. We have people out there who think they're fighting the new world order and so on, but they're sexually uh, licentious and they won't have power. If you want power, be chaste. There's no two ways about it. In your mind, in your eyes, don't look at it. Control yourself. The fires will die down and you will be able to transmute that power, which was God gave you as a creative, generative ability to do something real. And that's what Erta Zakat means. <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a deep truth. I do uh, refer you to my work on Zakat and on Salat. Save slight mistakes. Now in Arabic, this is Lamam, and it's the only instance of this noun. Little of use is found in the lexicons, and the root verb uh, has three senses that of gathering or uniting that of visiting or that of misfortune or mistake it also has the nuance of something small or slight and in the context it is the sense of misfortune or mistake which holds up and i render it here as slight mistakes most other translators render in a similar fashion since there is no question that complete sexual continence outside of marriage is the quranic standard Reading between the lines, I take lamam to indicate a man's unintentional sexual emissions during sleep. This is the standard. That's the standard that I hold to, and I didn't in my life, but I repented. And if you've been brought up in the society that I've been brought up in, you would have been indoctrinated with this weakness. The Quran is guiding us toward purity and strength, and this is the key to it. Now, strict Sexual morality is, as I say, the pan-textual value for zakat. And we give purity 
to our society by restraining ourselves within the bounds of sexual morality. And as I say, we garner strength by the same means. To continue, Thy Lord is of abounding mercy. He knew you best when he brought you into being from the earth, and when you were hidden in the bellies of your mothers. Then hold not your souls to be pure. He knows best those of prudent fear. Now, we are to hold ourselves in a right assessment. I speak openly, clearly. I've got a past. Uh, I think everybody has. I don't go on about it because I don't think it's something I really want to glorify. I don't hide it. But it's a fact and I know it's true. And anybody who's known me through my life will know that's true as well. Okay. We've all sinned. What the Quran does is call us to repent and to grow in sincerity and prudent fear. And God knows the truth of it no matter what you or I or anyone else might pretend to ourselves or others, God knows the truth. Verse 33. Hast thou then considered him who turned away and gave a little and was grudging? Has he knowledge of the unseen so he sees? Now, this is something which I touch on in my talks, that God promises us the greatest rewards. I say occasionally that I think I'm the best investment advisor you're ever going to meet. If you knew that you would receive a million dollars tomorrow for every penny that you spent today, how much would you spend today? You'd spend everything, wouldn't you? I know I would. So what this really refers to is it relates to the ascribing of um, of a foolishness, which is claiming that God is limited or believing that there's a restriction on God. And you, you find these people, they they want to do a little, but they don't want to do any more. I want to do as much as I can because I want as much as possible. And also you get more in this life. I'm not talking about financially here and certainly not in our case. But where the wealth really matters, I feel rich. And um, I would wish this wealth on everybody, really. But everyone must make their own decisions. However, if you think that giving just a little and then stopping is somehow prudent... The Quran would call you to task on that. Has he knowledge of the unseen so he sees? 36. Again, this is what is referred to as the hanging am in my work. And what it is, is a mechanism for identifying particular points and then addressing them. So verse 36. If he has not been informed of what is in the writings of Musa and of Ibrahim, who discharged obligations in full, and here it's ellipses, then here it is. So what this is doing is it's going to address this. If you have not been informed of what was in the writings of Musa and of Ibrahim, if your claim is that we no longer have the writings of Musa, we no longer have the writings of Ibrahim, who discharged obligations in full, the Quran is now going to give it to you. Once you understand this mechanism, it's quite obvious what's going on. And I can demonstrate why that's the case, because what follows is the answer the writings of Musa and Ibrahim, and as we will see as we go through, the prophet Nuh, who is mentioned, the communities Ad and Thamud, which are mentioned by name, preceded both Musa and Ibrahim. It doesn't mention things which happened after their time. It only mentions things which happened before both of their times. Thus, it's reasonable to conclude that what follows here is verbatim from those writings. And now, I assert we have a section which comes from the writings of Musa and of Ibrahim. Verse 38, that there bears not any bearer the burden of another. 39, and that man has not save that for which he strives, and that his striving will be seen, then will he be rewarded by the fullest reward, and that to thy Lord is the finality, and that he makes laugh and makes weep, and that he gives death and gives life and that he created the two mates, the male and the female, from a drop of fluid when it was emitted, and that upon him is the second creation, and that he makes free from need and enriches, and that he is the Lord of Sirius. Um, a quick aside on this point, Sirius is of particular importance on more than one count. Firstly, it's the brightest quote-unquote star in the sky. Um, I say quote-unquote because there are what were known as the wandering stars previously, and Obviously, it's not the brightest among those. Secondly, it will be recognised as a luminary of significance by any reader with a pre-existing knowledge of occult. 
i.e. hidden from general view learning. Whatever special connection those who believe they are privy to secrets feel that this star has for them, the Quran is clear. God is the Lord of Sirius. And the reason why I mention that is because many people who are involved in occult, satanic, etc. stuff, they make a big deal about Sirius. God is clear, and he is the Lord of Sirius. So, be told. 50. And that he destroyed the former Ad, and Thamud he left not, and the people of Nuh before they were further in wrongdoing and further in transgression. Now this section above sets out in simple terms what was in the writing of Musa and Ibrahim. We are required by the Quran to believe in former scriptures. This does not mean we should believe in corrupt scriptures. The Quran contains those parts of the former scriptures which were fully reliable and here is the essence of the writings of Musa and Ibrahim. To continue, 53. And the overthrown cities he destroyed and covered them with what he covered. Now this is in my opinion, a reference to the cities of Lut, and even so, this was in the time of Ibrahim, so it fits within the construction that I've uh, that I've highlighted. Now, clearly, the narrative refers back to the recipient of the Quran. It goes back into the into the singular form. Then, which of the blessings of thy Lord dost thou dispute? Now, after it's been through these, these are the writings of. Ibrahim Musa, this is the model, this is what I call the God protocol. Warn the elite, reap the believers, usually not many, and then come the judgments. The Prophet is operating according to this tradition and he's here being encouraged. And it continues at 56. This is a warner among the former warners. 57. The drawing near is at hand. There is none to remove it besides God. Now these three verses corroborate the points made above. In the event, God did remove it. And this is the import of chapter 110, which I'll quote now in full. When the help of God and the victory come, and thou seest mankind enter the doctrine of God in crowds, give thou glory with the praise of thy Lord, and seek thou forgiveness of him. He is receptive. So the, the point is, is that the recipient of the Quran was expecting destruction. He was expecting this, but God did remove it. Remember, 58, there is none to remove it besides God. And then we see at 110 that the help of God came and the victory and that you should give glory for this because God has stayed, the, as it were, the execution. 59, do you then marvel at this narrative and laugh and not weep while you are puffed up in heedlessness? Now, again, this relates to the fact that as I assert right the way through, that this whole segment is to form part of as-sujud, of the submission. This is a night vigil to which all people are to be invited. And obviously some people are going to be sitting there <laughs> laughing or saying, oh, I don't believe this, leaving, what have you, walking away, turning away. This is the context. Do you then marvel at this narrative and laugh and not weep while you are puffed up in heedlessness? The word which I translate as puffed up in heedlessness is... Uh, uh, from the verb uh, samada, which means to raise the head proudly or to thrust out the chest in pride, to be heedless or to be careless. So I've rendered so as to capture something of both these senses. And now we get to the close. This is the close of the whole thing. This is the point at which the Christians will say, now you've got to ask Jesus into your heart. No. This is the close of this entire chapter, verse 62. But submit to God and serve that's it again this is as I say part of a warning process that I call al sujud this night vigil this, this is part of a warning mechanism and this is a time when men made their determinations or should make their determinations regarding the message of God and also a time when believers can make their determinations about how that message is being received many of these chapters as we go through between 50 and 114. I mean, they have many functions, but one of them is, is what we might call Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to a lawyer if you cannot afford a lawyer. One once you've heard this, once this has been read to you, you have now been warned and enter into a new legal status. That's the function of them. 